Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 13. As we continue our study through this awesome book of Exodus, we come to this section where we found the Israelites. They have been fleeing from Egypt. Their exodus is taking place. God has miraculously delivered them from their bondage in Egypt. Um, they had been in Egypt for about 430 years total. And as we saw, their first stop was in Succoth, which is 15 miles from where they were, you know, enslaved near Ramses. Uh, it's where they ate the unleavened bread in haste. And as we pick up in chapter 13, verse 17, God will... Uh, lead the people on a 200-mile journey in three days. Two and a half million people. Could two and a half million people travel three days and cover about 200 miles? Well, uh, the answer is yes. Um, we'll see they travel both night and day. Uh, the average walking speed is three to four miles an hour. So if you just said three miles an hour, 72 hours and three days walking night and day is 216 miles. So yes, they could do it. Plus, we also see in Psalm 105, look at this Psalm, verse 37. This is speaking about the Exodus. And it says, He also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. And so God gave all those people supernatural strength to make that long journey through the wilderness of Sinai all the way to the Red Sea. And personally, we'll look at it in a moment. I believe they crossed the Red Sea at the Gulf of Aqaba. But look at verse 17. It says, Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So the quickest route to the promised land, that land flowing with milk and honey, it's along, it's called the Via Maris. And if you have that first slide uh, this is the Teal Line. That's the Via Maris. It takes you from Egypt along the Mediterranean coast directly into the Promised Land. That's the direct route. That's the easy way. But God said, no, you're not going to go the easy route. Um, as we see here, God did not put it on them to fast track their way to the promised land because it was the closest way. But God also knew they weren't ready to fight because the Egyptians actually had many army outposts along the Via Maris. And so God didn't want them. They weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They have not even picked up a, you know, battle implements, you know, for 430 years. They couldn't hold any weapons. That was illegal. And God knew they were not ready to face. They'd probably flee and scatter. They're going to face a lot of battles once they come into the promised land, but that'll be at the hands of Joshua 40 years later. And God had many more lessons for them. So God would lead them the 200 miles deeper into the desert, deeper into this region where they will literally be boxed in. They'll be pinned down. Nowhere to go up against the Red Sea, mountains on both sides. But that's when God would intervene and literally do one of the greatest miracles ever, I think, the parting of the Red Sea. Sometimes we wonder, you know, God, why are you taking my life in this direction? Lord, if you ask me, I think this other way would be better. Well, God did not ask you or me because God is God. And he knows what we need way more than we do. He knows infinitely more than you and I know. And so that's why we need to walk by faith and, and trust what he says in his word. Uh, we need to stop and recognize that God knows things that we do not know. He sees things that we're oblivious to. And like Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way <laughs> that seems right to a man, but the, uh, the end is the way of death. So, Lord, this makes more sense to me. Well, to you, yes, it does, but I have a better plan for your life. So we need to be open to what God wants to do. I don't fully understand everything God is doing. None of us really do. 
Um, he allows certain things to happen in our lives that we don't fully understand. But again, by faith, we know that God loves us. We know that all things do work together for good to those that love the Lord or the called according to his purpose. And so we got to walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 19 here in Exodus 13 says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So nearly 400 years earlier, uh, Joseph, he was one of those 12 sons of Jacob, and he was sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt uh, because of the famine that was coming and because of the prophecy God told Joseph what was going to happen. Joseph ends up becoming second in charge over all of Egypt, just under Pharaoh, and God used him mightily. And God spared the Egyptians. He also spared his own family. At the time, it was only like 75 people, but that was the Jewish race at that time. And so on his deathbed, he made uh, the, the, his brethren, the Israelites, promise that after he died, they would take his bones to the promised land. So here it is, 400 years later, and eventually Joseph would be buried in Shechem, which is in Israel. The very last three verses in the book of Genesis, this is how it ends. Look at these verses. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Again, that was his dad, Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him. And he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And so his embalmed body would be in that coffin for 400 years. And now it's time to haul him around for 40 years in the wilderness. I wouldn't really want to be the two guys that had that job. You know, okay, let's go. The cloud's moving. we got to haul these bones with us. But you talk about enduring faith. I mean, Joseph had enduring faith. Look at verse 20. So they took their journey from Succoth, and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Now, where is Etham? Some believe it was up near the Sea of Reeds, which is right outside where the Jews were living. It's only a few miles away, but that doesn't make any sense because technically that's still Egypt. Um, more recent archaeological discoveries place Etham near the top of the Red Sea called the Sea of Aqaba. So if you've seen pictures of the Red Sea, it's big, and then there's like two fingers on top, like the peace sign. And let's see, from your end, this is the Gulf of Suez, this would be the Gulf of Aqaba. And right at the very top of that was be, would be where Etham is found. Um, go ahead and put that slide up, because this would be a quick pit stop from Ramses, instead of going along the very top of the slide up to the promised land. God says he's going to take them a different direction by a cloud of uh, the pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire. And so they go down. And so you see the tip of that water on the right? Uh, right at the tip of that, that's where Etham is, right where it makes that bend and goes straight south. Um, that is the Sea of Aqaba. The very top of that Sea of Aqaba is where Eliot Elat, there in Israel today. Um, that is where Solomon had his navy uh, there at the Elat. It's very deep, as we'll see. Uh, the Gulf of Aqaba is about 5,000 feet deep, except for one little area we'll look at here in a moment. So that's Elat, El Etham. And then from there, we'll see God directs them to go south, and they'll end up at the Red Sea. So look at verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And so again, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, that was God's sign that he was with them. He was present with the Jews throughout their wandering for the next 40 years. 
Nobody knows how big these pillars were. Don't think of a pillar like this post here in the middle of the sanctuary. That's like a pillar. We'll see that, you know, they got pillars over there that are pretty big. Now, this pillar would be big enough to shade two and a half million people in the desert during the day when it gets up to 120 degrees in that area. The pillar of fire, same thing. It's huge. It gets into the 40s out in the desert when it gets chilly and that, I don't know how much heat it put off, but that's how God would guide them for 40 uh, years. But here we see they travel day and night uh, following after this, you could call it, you know, God's original GPS. You know, it's not global positioning system. It's God's positioning system. And, and the same is true for us, though. God is positioning them right where he wants them. He positions us right where he wants us. Many times we have no idea what God is doing. But God knows, and that's where we put our faith and trust in what he's doing. And that's when we really need to walk by faith and not by sight. The old saying is true. When you don't know what's going on, when you don't know what's happening in your life, fall back on what you do know. And what do you know from the Bible? Well, Jesus loves me. God is with me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. You know, I can hold fast to his promises. Fall back on what you know, the basics of who you are in Christ and what Christ is doing in your life. So notice again at the end of verse 21, it says they traveled by day and night. Brings us into chapter 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi -haherot. I'll say it that way this time and probably a few different other ways. I think it's pi -haherot between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. From uh, this situation, okay, go ahead and put that, first, that last slide back up there, the last one you had. So see the top of the Gulf of Aqaba, that little finger at the right. Why didn't they just go around that? Well, God did not want them to go around it. God was putting them between a rock and a hard place. He sends them south. Um, where it ends, it's a beach called uh, the Nueva Beach. And we'll look at that in greater detail here in a little bit, not just yet. But God will send them there, and this is where he will box them in. In fact, we'll go ahead and put up the next slide. There's a wadi. It's called uh, the Wadi Watir. And once you get down towards that beach, you can see the white line coming through there, zigzagging, and it winds its way up north. That is called the Wadi Watir. It's 18 mile through this narrow canyon, and it ends up on that beach, and that beach is Nueva Beach. It's the only place on the Red Sea where you could fit two and a half to three million people. It's huge. There's no way out. If you go north or south on the coast, the mountains go right to the water. Uh, the only way in is the way God directed them through that wadi, this narrow canyon, and that's right where he wants his people to be. Uh, notice from these pictures, there's no way out. Also, um, they discovered two pillars. Do you have one before that? Just put up the next slide. Yeah, these pillars... One they found, in 1978, they found it laying down the Egyptian side, these two pillars, and the other one's on the uh, Saudi Arabia side, and they were both knocked down. They're about 50 feet in length, and the cool thing is, the one on the left in Egypt, it's on Nueva Beach, and they've dated it 3,000 years ago. The one in Saudi Arabia, it was dated 3,000 years ago. Same size, same dimensions. They actually found, in Hebrew, they found the names of Moses, and Pharaoh, and the Red Sea crossing, and they were erected by Solomon. There's even a reference to it in Isaiah. But Solomon built these 3,000 years ago. Again, his ships were just north of here, but they believed they, he erected them for uh, commemorating this crossing of the Red Sea there from Nueva Beach straight over to Zeph, what was it called? Baal Zephon, which is in Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabians, once that was discovered, because it's out in the middle of nowhere. Back then, 50 years ago when they found it, there was nothing there. And they erected it on the Egypt side. Well, the Saudis, because of the 
Hebrew names and everything, they removed it. They put a little plaque there in its place that you just saw, that little round disc. That's where it was found. Anyway, it's pretty amazing. One way in, no way out. So this is where the people camp by the sea. And this is why Pharaoh thinks, I've got them right where I want them. They're trapped, nowhere to go. These Hebrews, they're just dumb. Moses has no clue what he's doing, and he's led them into my trap. But we're going to see, no, God is leading Pharaoh into God's trap. Look at verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Again, Moses has no clue what he's doing. They're confused. And so even though Pharaoh and his nation have already been devastated by God with the ten plagues, the death of his own firstborn, the death of the firstborn throughout Egypt, he still thinks, I can take these Jews either back as slaves or more likely by now he wants to kill them all. Annihilate them because of what their God, Yahweh, has done to Egypt and the people of Egypt. Again, God is setting this whole scene up. For one thing, God will deal with Pharaoh and Egypt once and for all, give them one final blow at this time. But the other thing is, God is the one who's allowed his people to be boxed into this very hard place. Literally nowhere to go. They couldn't fight their way out of this. They couldn't run and hide. Uh, it's 10 miles across the, the Red Sea right there. And there's no way they're going to swim for it. So this is where God wants him to be with zero options. You ever been there? I have nowhere to go, Lord. I have nothing I can do. I just feel like I'm at the end of my rope. But God, but God, he always has a plan. He always has a solution. And God will prove to all of them that he is the great I am. He is the one true God. He is I don't even know how the song goes, but, you know, he's the promise keeper. He's the miracle worker. He's the one who will finish what he started. And not only was that true 3,500 years ago at this scene, but it's also true today. He will do what he needs to do in your life. He will always keep his promises to you. He will always fulfill his word, and he will finish what he started. You know, some of you know one of my favorite verses is Philippians 1.6. And it says, in being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, he started it, he began a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. A great example of God being a miracle worker. What's the greatest example to me is just looking around this room and knowing those of you who have given your life to Jesus. He's taken you from death to life. That's the greatest miracle there is. You were dead in your sins. He made you alive together in Christ. Uh, these verses tell us amazingly what God has done, taking dead sinners and giving us new life. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked <laughs> according to the course of this world, According to the pr prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh and of the, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, we were all born sinners, just as the others were no better than anybody else in this world. And here's the key, but God, that pivots the whole scenario, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And here's how he did it. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so what an amazing God we serve. He has miraculously taken us from death to life, from darkness utter darkness, spiritual darkness, and he's given us the light of Jesus. And he's about to do the same for his people here in Exodus. Look at verse 4. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So once again, God is bringing this all together. 
Pharaoh still thinks, I, I've got the Jews right where I want them, nowhere to go. I'm going to destroy them. But God is allowing Pharaoh to totally rely on his fleshly instincts here. And again, in his pride, in his arrogance, he thinks, I'm going to get them. Now, you would think that after all that God has done in devastating Egypt and the Egyptian people, you would think he'd learn his lesson. It's like, come on, how many times do you have to hit your head against that brick wall? I've had God ask me that a few times over the years. Jeff, how many times are you going to keep doing that? But as God says here, I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. So this miracle of God will be remembered by God's people throughout their history for the most part, a few gaps along the way, but also God's enemies, the Israelites' enemies will remember this. Remember when they come into Jericho, uh, Rahab the harlot, you know, she's the one that is in the hall of faith now because of her faith and trust in the Lord. But she says, we were fearful of you. We know 40 years earlier, we know what God did to the Egyptians. I mean, everybody knew what God did. Now, on a side note here, once the Lord brings the Israelites through the Red Sea, much of the next few months we'll see in Exodus, they'll spend at the base of Mount Sinai. Now, the question is, where is Mount Sinai? The traditional site, and I can pretty much say all of your Bibles, my Bible, <laughs> when you look at the map of the Exodus route, and you can look at it, it's like, where did they cross the Red Sea? They don't have any place where they cross the Red Sea. They have them going down the side of the Sinai Peninsula, and then they go back up the side of the Sinai Peninsula, and they go back around into Saudi Arabia. Where do they cross the Red Sea? Tradition says the Sea of Reeds. That's at the very north of the Gulf of Suez, which is only about 12 inches deep. I don't think that's the site of this amazing miracle. Um, again, we'll look at this in a moment. But when God first appeared to Moses, oh, and by the way, the very point of that Sinai Peninsula, that's where Egyptians say, that's Mount Sinai. Saudi Arabia says, no, this is Mount Sinai over in Saudi Arabia. So where was Moses when God said, Moses, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. He reveals himself to Moses as the great I am. It was at Mount Horeb in Midian. Midian is in Saudi Arabia. It went from Midian, they called it Arabia, now it's called Saudi Arabia. It's not in Egypt. It's never been in the Sinai. So we'll look at that here in a moment. Um, in fact, put up that picture of Mount Sinai if you've got it. Um, that's Nueva Beach, that's the Red Sea, and you see that little arrow pointing out there, that is what Saudi Arabia claims to be Mount Sinai. Do you have another one after that? On top of that Mount Sinai, that whole area there, it's black, charred black, for no reason. <laughs> There's nothing out there, that whole area is just charred black, and that's where, I believe, Controversial, but I believe that's where God met with Moses because it talks about, you know, the mountain being charred and the flames and the fire and the earthquake and, the, you know, just lightning and all that stuff. And it's a pretty amazing scene. So Mount Horeb, again, became Mount Sinai. It's in Midian. Uh, 2,000 years ago, when Paul's writing to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 4, he's making this contrast between Abraham's two sons he says, Isaac, he is the son of Sarah, the son of promise, representing God's grace. Then he mentions Hagar and her son Ishmael, representing the law. And then he says in Galatians 4, 24 and 25, for these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So not in Egypt, but in Arabia. So it's interesting, both countries claim to have the real Mount Sinai. To me, a lot of this boils down to whether you believe in a God who gets the Israelites through a foot of water and destroys the entire Egyptian army in a foot of water, or you believe in a God who can part deep waters, the deep waters of the Red Sea, 
and then drown an entire Egyptian army when he stops holding back the waters that he has parted. And I know for myself which God I need to believe in, the one who will deliver me from the depths of the Red Sea, the one who will deliver me when I'm in over my head, the one who will deliver me when I'm boxed in with nowhere to go. I don't need a swamp God. I need a God that can part the Red Sea. Well, look at verse 5. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea, by Pihahirot <laughs> before Baal Zephon. Again, Pihahirot is the, the, the beach there at Nueva. Baal Zephon is on the other side in Saudi Arabia. So he pursues them all that direction. So again, with one final attempt, Pharaoh uses all of his power, his might, to try to stop God's people. Again, he doesn't realize God is drawing him into God's trap. Pharaoh thinks we've got him right where we want him. By the way, that's what Satan will do to you. He thinks, oh, I got them now. I got them to stumble. I got them to do this. I got them to do that. And now they're trapped. I've got them. But God, but God has a way out. God has forgiveness. God has cleansing. God can do more than we are capable of realizing. Um, I know that in me and my flesh dwells no good thing, but I know Jesus Christ is greater than he that's in the world. Remember 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Always remember, God is on our side. He will see us through the storm. He'll see us through whatever trial we face, and we are safe and secure in the hand of Jesus. At the same time, I'm sure these Israelites were terrified at this moment because the army of Pharaoh was huge. Now, anytime you've seen a movie of the Exodus, what will you see is a bunch of chariots going into the Red Sea. And, you know, they say 600 choice chariots. But they leave out all the chariots of Egypt, all the horsemen, and the army of the Egyptians. They had a huge army still at this point. In fact, it was Josephus, the Jewish historian, that said this army that went to the Red Sea of Egypt was 250,000 men. So it wasn't just 60 or 90 or a few hundred chariots, 600 chariots. This is a lot. This is 250,000 Egyptians coming quickly against the unprotected <laughs> you know, Israelites. Look at verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, so they were afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Well, that's a good thing to do, but this is the other thing they shouldn't do. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Again, this just blows my mind, because after everything God has done for them, their attitude is, we were better off in Egypt? It shows their lack of faith, their understanding of who God is, what He's already done for them. How are they better off as slaves? For 400 years, they were being mistreated. They were being beaten. They were having their children thrown in the Nile River and drowned at the orders of Pharaoh. Have they forgotten just how they were being worked to death? You know, I don't know about you, but I would rather die for Jesus today than go back to the bondage I was in before I got saved, the Egypt 
represents the world, represents our bondage. I'd rather get, just die, get hit by a truck today and go home to be with Jesus than go back to that former life. Unbelievable. That's what the Israelites are thinking right now. But Satan always tries to get Christians to think that life was easier, life was simpler, life was better before Jesus interrupted your plans. What a lie from the pit of hell. The life I was living, the path I was on before Jesus got a hold of my life was full of confusion, bitterness, emptiness, just destruction, self-destruction. But once Jesus saved me, I never looked back. I mean, he removed the confusion. He gave me clarity. He removed the anger and bitterness I had, and he gave me peace. He gave me joy. I mean, everything I have in my life is because of God's goodness and his grace. He filled my empty heart with his love. And he took you and me off that path of destruction, and he placed us on that path of righteousness that really is filled with purpose and meaning. So why would you want to go back to Egypt? Remember the old Keith Green song? So you want to go back to Egypt? Google it. It's an awesome song. But at this moment, when things looked hopeless, they blamed Moses. They blamed the preacher. <laughs> But it wasn't Moses' fault. They were in this scary place. It's not because of Moses. Moses is just following the cloud. I'm just going where the pillar of fire is taking us. I'm just going where the pillar of cloud is taking us. It's not Moses' fault. But again, Romans 8.28, don't ever forget that verse. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, and again, this is why Moses is one of the great men of faith. This is why he's considered one of the greatest men in history, not just the Bible. But he says, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. That phrase, hold your peace, literally means be quiet. And close your mouth. But here we see why Moses is so amazing. Don't be afraid, but just watch. Watch what God's going to do. He's going to move. He's going to stir things up. He's going to take us where he wants us to go. You're going to see these enemies destroyed. But that theme is throughout the Bible. Fear not, or don't be afraid. Why? Because Jesus is in the boat with us. Remember when they're in the boat and the storm hits and the disciples are freaking out? Jesus is asleep. He rebukes the wind and the waves. And he tells them, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I told you we're getting to the other side. I didn't say we're going under. We're going over. God knows how fearful, how weak we are. But more, the more we grow in our relationship with God, the more we grow in our fellowship with Jesus, the more we, we become dependent on the Holy Spirit and we become dependent on the Word of God, the less fearful we will be as we live in this crazy, messed up world. So here's Moses standing in the midst of two and a half million frightened, fearful people, and he says, don't be afraid. Be still. Watch what God's going to do. See the salvation, the deliverance of the Lord. Now, as we have seen over the last three years, <laughs> there's a lot of fear in our nation and in the world. Fear is contagious. I mean, our government spreads fear all that it can. Our media spreads fear. Social media spreads fear. Certain doctors working for big pharmaceutical companies love to spread fear. But God certainly does not want us to walk in fear. Stand still. Watch what God will accomplish for you today. And no matter what is coming against you, nothing should cause you to fear. Nothing should cause you to cower in a corner in these days in which we live. You know, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Stand fast. Watch what God can do. Jesus is the, in the boat. He's in the storm. He says, I am with you always. We'll see this when we get there eventually with Joshua. And Joshua is leading them. Finally, after 40 years of wandering the wilderness, he will lead them to battle. 
and victory after victory in the promised land. But before they cross the Jordan River, he is fearful. He is just trembling. Moses is dead. He's in charge. And he's just like, ah, I don't know what to do. So over and over again, we see this. And here's a great verse that capsulizes it. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. God reminds him. God says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. Why? Well, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, he's with you in this life. Whatever you do, when you go into a job interview, Jesus is with you. You get fired from a job, Jesus is with you. You know, whatever you're doing, whatever you're going through surgery, you're going through trauma, you're going through whatever it might be, God is with you. Be still, Moses says. Realize that God is there. Look at this psalm, Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Again, verse 14 says, The Lord will fight for you. Again, the, the battle belongs to the Lord. He is for us. He's our defender. He's our deliverer. Paul reminds us of the spiritual battles we're in. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You know, Ephesians 6 deals with the full armor of God that we're to put on because it is a spiritual battle we're facing, but we don't have to fight from fear. We can fight from faith. Look at verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children to go of Israel to go forward. Now, it's kind of funny because he's telling Moses, Tell everybody, go forward. Where? There's a little big old sea in front of it, 10 miles across. Just go forward. Don't cry to me. Go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen, then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And so in so many words, God is telling Moses, there is a time to pray, but there's also a time to act. Now is not the time to pray, Moses. Now is the time to act. Move forward. Yes, God is going to do something spectacular. But if you don't get up and move, you're going to miss out what God is going to do. You'll miss out on His plans. You can pray, and it's important to pray. And when God opens the door, if you just sit there and look at the door, what's that going to do for you? Get up and move forward. Go through the open doors that He has for you and watch what God can do. Too many Christians are content watching from the sidelines. But God wants all of us involved in the things he is doing. And when more of us get involved in the spiritual battles that God is fighting and winning, the people of this world, the Egyptians, will begin to know, they'll begin to take notice and see that our God reigns, that our God is in control, that he is the one true living God. Look at verse 19. Interesting phrase, and the angel of God. Who's that? Went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light and, uh, by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. I believe this is Jesus himself. He is called the angel of God. A few times, it's a Christophany. It's an Old Testament appearing of Jesus. Remember when Jacob wrestled with God all night long? Peniel, I've wrestled with God. That's Jesus. God doesn't have a body. It says God is spirit, but Jesus will appear in the Old Testament. 
Sometimes he's referred to as the angel of the Lord. He's the one who appeared to Abraham before the two angels destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So he was the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. He goes behind the Israelites, becomes a barrier between the Egyptians and the Israelites here. And what a picture this is. It's almost like Jesus standing there between them saying, if you're intending to harm my people, then you're going to have to come through me. And they couldn't get through him. All night long, it says, he stood as a cloud of darkness. The Egyptians, they couldn't even go through it. They couldn't even get there. It was just like a wall. They couldn't even penetrate. It was just darkness, so thick, they couldn't move. The other side, though, was light. The, the Israelites had light all that night. It's kind of like the Bible. You talk to people about the Bible. If they're not a believer, they're like, you're an idiot. Who would believe that? That was written by men. It's, it's, they're in total darkness. But for us, what is the word of God? It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. It's God's word. So look at verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. What a scene. All night long, this huge wall of water on each side. All night long, the Israelites crossed on the dry floor of the Red Sea. There's a section from Nueva Beach over to Baal Zephon. Again, some call it an underwater bridge. I don't look at it that way because it's still deep. So it'll go 300 feet, and at the middle of the Sea of Aqaba, it's 900 feet deep, and then it comes up to 300 feet, and then it's on the other side. The drop-off from that shelf, though, is 5,000 feet deep of water. So God all night blows the winds or whatever he did. Well, we'll see next time. He blows his nostrils. That's all it takes for God, and he parts the waters. So you got like three, maybe 900 feet of water on each side, these huge walls. Can you imagine? I mean, just uh, <laughs> going through that. I wonder if they could see is like, you know, like a aquarium or something. You've seen fish on the other side looking at you as you're walking through. I mean, it must have been amazing. Just just huge wall. And they walk on dry land across to the other side. Well, look at verse 23. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he confused them, and he took off their chariot wheels as they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord, Yahweh there, fights for them and against the Egyptians. And so again, as the last of the Israelites are coming up out of the Red Sea, they cross over safely. God lifts up the, the, the cloud that was preventing the Egyptians from coming over, and all of a sudden they just rush in as fast as they can. They're probably freaking out looking at the walls of water, but they said, hey, if the Israelites could do it, so can we. And as the Lord caused the chariot wheels to fall off, they realize we're in trouble. Uh, their God is fighting for them against us. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Look at verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea. So, again, all night long, two and a half million Israelites file across orderly fashion through the water, dry land. And then he says, after they get to the other side, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out, his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth. Doesn't sound like the sea of reeds and 12 inches of water to me. 
And when the morning appeared, full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. I mean, can you imagine? Even if it's 300 feet of water, that's bigger than any wave we've ever seen in this world. I mean, I surfed many years growing up in San Diego. The biggest waves I ever tried to surf were 15 feet high. It sounds not that big compared to this. And I'll tell you what, we, my friend and I, we got wallops. I mean, it just walled up on us, drove us down to the bottom. You're on the bottom, you're spinning around, you don't know which way is up. A lot of surfers have died because they lose direction, they can't get up. The water will keep rolling sometimes and keep you down 15 feet of water. This is 300 feet of water minimum, maybe 900 feet of water. Amazing. So not, not one of them remained. Verse 30, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So again, what an incredible scene this is. God caused the walls of water to collapse upon them. Not one remained. To me, there's no doubt this is not the Sea of Reeds. That would be a greater miracle in my mind if God did this, destroying 250,000 Egyptians in a foot of water. Now, that, to me, is silly. But again, it says they, the Red Sea returned to its full depth. It covered their chariots and horsemen all, and all the army of Pharaoh. You're not going to cover up anything in a foot of water. Swamps don't have seashores. All these dead bodies are on the seashores. What's the result? The people of God feared the Lord. They believed the Lord. Next time we'll see the greatest, largest worship service that will break out as the two and a half million people of God spontaneously begin to praise the Lord. But before we close, there's a few more pictures um, what else you got up there? So that's the Wadi. So this is 18 miles of this leading to the Red Sea. And there's Nueva Beach. And there's the land mass underwater. That's right off of Nueva Beach there. It crosses over 5,000 feet on each side of that. It goes deep. They get to the other side. Divers have looked for remains. The one on the left questionable. The one on the top right is coral encrusted. They think it's chariot wheels. Uh, in 1978, a guy named Ron Wyatt discovered these scuba diving. Nobody had ever looked there. And so he's like the first one. In 2020, they did another excavation. He, he's long gone, but another group of scientists have gone in there and they've, they've found more things. Put that next one up again. So the chariot wheels. Now, skeptics have said, well, that can't be true because wood would never survive because most of these are wooden wheels. They could never survive 3,500 years. Well, of course they couldn't. That's why coral eats away the wood and the coral leaves the formation of what it's eaten. And so these are the coral remains of probably chariot wheels. What else you got? There's a few more. Um, looks like a hub. A couple more they found. Yeah, the one with the gold on the bottom right, uh, coral will not grow on gold. By the way, that whole section across there is nothing but sand, and coral will not grow on sand. It needs some kind of structure to grow on. Because there's coral reefs further north in the Sea of Aqaba. You, you can go scuba diving, skin diving there in Elat, beautiful area, very clear waters. Is that it? Okay. So, be that as it may, God is in control. God is the one who brought his people safely through the depths of the Red Sea, and he can safely bring you through the depths of whatever you're facing in this life. 
He is with us always till the end of this age. Praise the Lord. Don't ever think that God has forgotten about you. Don't ever think he's given up on you. If you're a prodigal son or daughter today, maybe you've done things you know is wrong. How could God still love me? That's kind of where the prodigal son was. But remember, he was a son and he just needed to humble himself. And that's what he did. It says it came to his senses and he realized even my father's servants, my father's slaves, they have it better than this. I'm in this pig pen wrestling these pigs over carob pods. And if I humble myself, maybe he'll take me back as one of his slaves, one of his servants. You know the story. He comes out of the pig pen, probably smelled pretty ripe. And he's coming back home to his father. And his father sees him from a long ways off, runs out to his son, throws his arms around him, pig stench and all throws his arms around him, puts his robe on him, takes a ring off his finger, puts it on his son. My son who was lost is found. My son who I thought was dead is alive. He rejoiced because his son simply realized, I've blown it, I've messed up, but God still loves me. Maybe he'll take me back. No, he will take you back. Jesus is not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Again, he's with us always. If you're in a bad place today spiritually, I encourage you, just surrender your heart back to the Lord. He loves you.